I am very honored and proud to present you Bill Binney on the stage. And he will be telling us the perspective from the inside of the NSA because he was a technical director of the NSA for many years and worked in the intelligence services for more than 37 years. He is a child of the Cold War and worked throughout the Cold War decrypting and breaking ciphers from the adversaries of the US. And back then he used to call himself the technical director of the world, in a sense. So, please give it away for how the NSA tracks you with Bill Binney. Thank you. Thank you. I'd, I'd like to say it's uh, nice to be back in a large, with large numbers of people with character and integrity, uh, which uh, when I worked at NSA, not too many people had. I was all looking at military and governmental encryptions and codes and, and uh, activity. Uh, so, uh, but the same techniques apply to any crypt system. I mean, it's not something that, and I was on the offensive side, not the defensive side. And I know, uh, I knew uh, Snow and the defensive people. Uh, and I went to talk to them once about saying, here, I had all these solutions on the offensive side. And, and uh, can you tell me how you're designing the defensive side? Because I thought that they should be parallel. You know, we, <clears throat> what, what we were doing, they were doing, and they wouldn't tell me. So that shows you the same kind of, there's that kind of communications now, like for example, for cybersecurity, uh, all the attacks that have come out of Vault 7 and the NSA uh, exposures, uh, hundreds of millions of lines of source code on attacks on, uh, you know, firewalls, switches, servers, operating systems, all of that, that's thousands of attacks. And we've only seen a few of them so far used to, in the world. And you can just be ready for a much rougher ride uh, because the offensive side knew all these things were weak and existing. The defensive side didn't and they never fixed anything. So we were all vulnerable. So we all got attacked. And so now they say every time you get attacked, we need more money, more people, more empire. You know, so it's a swindle. We're all being swindled by our governments. Uh, if they, if they would only fix the things they knew that were wrong, we might have some security, you know? So, but instead they don't. So at any rate, uh, I didn't, uh, when I left NSA, I did that in, uh, at the end of October 2001 because they started spying on individuals and not groups of bad guys, okay? So that meant they were scooping up everything from everybody in the world. Uh, and, and it's much more extensive than anybody thought. It's more extensive than even the slides show. Uh, but because, uh, and in order to store all this material, they had to build the Bluffdale one, one million square foot facility for storing data. Uh, and uh, last year they broke ground for uh, a, now a 2.8 million square foot facility on Fort Meade. It took out a 36 hole golf course to do it. So, I mean, the point is, if you collect everything, it's an ever increasing amount of data year after year, which means you need ever-increasing data storage facilities to store it all. The way we found out about this was to look at the, every time the government wants to build something, they have to file an environmental uh, study. So when they, when they wanted to put in this very large building, they had to uh, also submit an environmental impact statement and study uh, to, to do it before they did it. So we're looking at those and seeing what they're building. So when they do that, we know, uh, well, this is on Fort Meade and it's the, it's the NSA doing it. So, you know, everything on, virtually everything on Fort Meade is NSA anyway. So that, that gave us the knowledge of uh, the scale of what they're collecting and what they're uh, assembling. Uh, for example, in uh, Cisco, who sold them the routers to route data to the uh, Utah facility, uh, estimated, um, there was a small article they wrote years ago, that estimated that uh, by 2015, the amount of data going into the Utah facility would be 966 exabytes a year. That's about a zettabyte. So that's why originally years ago, I estimated that uh, the capacity of Utah was about five zettabytes. I mean, it's my guess, you know, it, it's a lot of bytes anyway. <laughs> so at any rate, I felt I didn't have to take anything with me because everybody in Congress, when I left, I, you know, they all knew me, they knew what I was doing. Most of what they're doing to spy on everybody, I designed anyway or had a hand in it. So they knew all that. So I felt I didn't have to, to, uh, to uh, bring any material out to, to validate anything I was saying because they all knew I did it. So <clears throat> I, uh, 
I uh, naively thought that I could do that and go complain through the channels, the intelligence committees and the inspector generals, and they would all take some action on it. Well, <clears throat> what it really meant was uh, when it came time to actually hearing what I had to say, Congress never invited me in. I mean, I testified in the Bundestag, I testified in the House of Lords in the UK, but the Congress would never hear me because then they'd lose plausible deniability. That was really their key. They needed to have plausible deniability so they could continue this massive spying program because it gave them power over everybody. Everybody in the world. Even the members of Congress had power against others. They had power on the judges and the Supreme Court, the, the, the federal judges, all of them. That's why they're so afraid. Everybody's afraid because all this data they had that's, that about them, uh, the, the uh, central agencies, the intelligence agencies, they have it. And that's why Senator Schumer... Uh, warned uh, President Trump earlier, a few few months uh, ago, that he shouldn't attack the intelligence community because they've got, you know, six ways to Sunday to come at you. That's because it's like J. Edgar Hoover on super steroids. They have, they have the same kind of data that J. Edgar Hoover had on everybody. So it's leverage against every member of parliament and every government of the world. When, when Edward Snowden came out, he came out with material and slides and, and, and uh, publications by the government about the programs they were running. That gave me, and that was the stuff I left them, so it gave me all the opportunity to pull it together and say, this is what they're doing, this is how they're doing, this is what it means. And that's what I've been trying to do. So I assembled some slides here to give you some idea, hopefully, uh, a better idea of, of what's going on. And I also assembled uh, some slides to show you what they should be doing. I have one, only one case of an unclassified version of big data analysis which is what they should be doing, and they aren't. That's why people are getting killed. That's why I said in the UK that bulk data kills people, uh, because all the analysts in the UK and in, the, in, the, in MI5 and in, and in GCHQ, similarly in the FBI and NSA, they're buried in data and they can't see what's happening because there's just too much data. And they're using the old techniques of word searches and stuff like that. That's not the way to do it at all. It's social networking is the key to solving all of these problems, solving them quickly, and making all the data content problem a manageable thing. Now, I'll, I'll take you into that. So, here, uh, <clears throat> these, are the, these are the ways that uh, they basically collect data. First, it's, uh, they use the corporations that run the fiber optic lines, uh, and they get them to allow them to put taps on them, and I'll show you some of the taps where they are. And, and if that doesn't work, they use the foreign government to go at their own uh, telecommunications companies to do the similar thing. And if that doesn't work, they'll tap the line anywhere they can get to it, and they won't even know it. No, the governments, nor the communications companies will even know they're tapped. So that's how they get into it. Then they get into the fiber lines. And this is, uh, this is uh, the prison program uh, is really where they have the, uh, the, the uh, companies involved. That's down there, uh, and a list of them. This came out, was one of the first, uh, first things that was published out of the Snowden material, and it all focused on PRISM. Well, PRISM is really the, uh, the minor program. I mean, the major program is upstream. That's where they have the fiber optic taps on hundreds of places around in the world. That's where they're collecting off the fiber line all the data and storing it. PRISM was simply their, their way of putting out something uh, where Congress and the courts could look at it and say, well, we're abiding by the law. See, here we ask these companies for this data and we have a warrant for that to do it. So you see, we're abiding by the law. When in upstream, they were, t and they were taking everything off the line. Also, their, the muscular program was a parallel one, which uh, basically uh, did the, uh, for, uh, you know, uh, Yahoo and, and Google and a couple others, they unilaterally tapped lines between their data centers when they transferred data to back it up and so on. They got everything they had, and they didn't know it. And PRISM was only one small input to the data that NSA was collecting. Um, worldwide, these are the kinds of things they have. I mean, it's satellites, it's all kinds of collection. The real big one is over there at CNE, Computer Network Exploitation. That's where they're implanting either with uh, hardware or software, or both. Uh, into switches and servers around the world, and they can make them do anything they want because they own them. So if you send data anywhere uh, through those switches or uh, servers, and there's tens of thousands of them in the world, uh, they basically own the network. So all of that uh, is feeding another program that they call Treasure Map. Uh, and this one just says, well, we want to know where everything is in the world. 
uh, every minute of the day. So it's not just collecting what you're saying, encrypted or not, but it's also uh, monitoring where you are when you do it. And that's uh, basically done by, <clears throat> this is a kind of a, the geography of the world, and there's the physical layout of the fibers and the microwaves and the satellite towers and everything. And then that maps to a, a physical network and then logical networks, who's communicating across them. That maps to e equipment, which in turn maps to people, and that's how they follow everybody. This is also when you have cell phones, for example, how they take GPS and use the drones to target, to target people. So uh, I think... Uh, Jacob Applebaum was the one who said uh, some NSA tracks them and CIA whacks them, right? At, <clears throat> and the way they do that, and there's 1.2 million people on the drone list according to the last number I saw. I mean, that's crazy. I mean, you know, they aren't even, they aren't making, they aren't verifying who, who's, who they're hitting. They're not, I mean, they're just going to kill people all the time. This is insane. I call that program uh, random slaughter because that's about what it is. And this is why I get in their face every time I possibly can in the U.S. because they're doing stupid stuff. It's hurting a lot of people. But anyway, rate, that's, that's the treasure map. All the material they collect from all the sources goes back into these programs back inside NSA over here on that rectangle over there, or that's basically a square fundamentally. <laughs> this was the entire design. Uh, these programs, uh, Mainway and Marina, are basically the graphs of social networks that map into the databases in Pinwheel, the internet, and Nucleon, the uh, voice. There are basically two systems they're following. Public switch telephone network, which is all the phones, fixed, mobile, uh, satellite, all, all ki any kind of phone. All the content data then goes into Nucleon, and it's indexed up there by the Marina program, so that when they want to see who did what, they have an index all to everything they ever said in their database. This was the whole design, I left them, and they haven't changed a damn thing in 15 years, 16 years. So, that's real progress for you. But at any rate, uh, one of the things to look over here on the side is that uh, <clears throat> both CIA and the FBI, through the FBI Center in Quantico, Virginia, have a direct access into these databases and, and the entire graph. Not only that, but they also use that for police around the world. So it's a straight violation of everything. All this data is collected without warrants. So, uh, you know, it's a basic violation of the rights of every human in a court of law, and that's what they're using. They're using it to arrest people, and then they pull a substitution. I've got some slides on that, too. And these are other people who have access to it. Uh, the, the Five Eyes group over here, they have direct access into the, uh, into the uh, NSA database right here. Um, and so do uh, the Drug Enforcement Administration, uh, Defense Intelligence Agency, FBI, CIA. All these people have direct access to all this data. And it's children's data as well. It's everybody on the line because they take it all. So it's nothing, there's no distinction. They don't filter anything. It's just capture everything. This is what a General Alexander said in Menwith Hill Station a few years ago. He said, all we have to do is collect it all. And that's what they're doing. The problem is, once you collect it all, uh, and, and they have the impression, or they give the impression, that data is intelligence, right? When you collect more data, you have more intelligence. It's not... The point is, you have intelligence when you understand the meaning of what you've collected. If you can't do that, I mean, you have nothing but a bunch of data. And that, unfortunately, that's, that's the perspective they have, so they, they think collecting more is better. Instead, what happens is it buries their analysts and buries the, the, both the police and the, and the intelligence people, and they can't figure anything out. So, you know, what the consequences of uh, planned attacks happen because they don't see them coming and they can't prevent them. And uh, so that's why I said when I went to the UK to try to stir them up, you know, I wanted to get them upset. I said uh, bulk data, because they were getting ready to pass the uh, investigative powers bill, the bulk acquisition of data on everybody in the UK as well as every, everybody they can possibly get in the world. I said bulk data kills people. And the reason I said that is because of the inability to stop terrorist attacks, for example. I mean, we continue to see these things today. I mean, nothing has changed. They're still going after more, more data, more, more, you know, more, more people, more of an empire, and they still can't figure out what they've got. But they're really good after the fact after the fact, once they know who did it, they've got all the data on them. They could go directly at them. The other thing it does give them, though, is the power to, uh, to manipulate anybody they want or do industrial espionage or 
or if, somebody's, if, 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 if somebody is uh, getting a, a, a political group together or getting politically active and they don't want them, they have the ability to target them here you, using this data. I mean, it's just, it's just there. All they have to do is uh, go at it. So they can target people and use it against them, but they can't look at all of it to figure out who out there is planning an attack on us or is going to smuggle weapons or smuggle uh, dope or any of that. They can't do that because they've, they've got too much data and they're using stupid searches like word searches. Well, you know, if they use the word bomb, you know, if they're looking at somebody planning a bomb or building a bomb, we could say, if you say uh, in an email <clears throat> to anybody, well, you know, the quarterback threw a bomb at the last to win the game, you know, what, your, your email is going to be, be picked up by that word search, and it's absolutely irrelevant to anything they're looking for. That's the point. That's why social networking of focusing in on those networks that are involved in terrorism or the ones you know with the seeds you have, I would point out that all of the terrorist attacks that have ever happened before or after 9-11 have been by people who were known by either the intelligence or the police or both. So why weren't they focusing on them? If they were, they may have a chance to prevent the attack. Instead, they're looking at this bulk stuff. I mean, it does, it does spend a lot of money. It employs a lot of people. So it's a, what I call a happiness management program. But... Uh, the point is that uh, to keep it going, sometimes people have to die, and that's 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 just un un un, un uh, that's un-American. First of all, you know, no American would do that. No one would sacrifice the lives of anybody for this crap, but they do, and they do it because there's a big empire behind this. I mean, to collect all this data, the intelligence community, mostly NSA, has spent somewhere close to 200 billion dollars since 9/11 just to get the data. I mean, they, and they built an empire worldwide to do it, and they've got all these, all these countries come that are participating in that. So, um, and, and the big, the closest are, of course, these here. Um, I should point out that, you see this date over here, down at the bottom right, 2032-018. That's the eighth day of January of 2032. That means it's the first review, classification review for this slide. 25 years. So if you subtract 25 years from that, it's the 8th of January of 2007 or 2007. That was the date the slide was created. So this was the state of things in 2007. Right? If you look at all these slides, you'll see many times I'll have a date there and you can figure out, well, this is the date of that, of that program, you know? So at any rate, this is where they use the things uh, for... Uh, the rule of, uh, for the SOD, that's the Special Operations Division of the Drug Enforcement Administration. Uh, the police, they, they have also the FBI, CIA, NSA, the DHS, the IRS, uh, all have representatives on the SOD, and they all look into the NSA data. The IRS is supposed to be there for fraud, you know, and things like that, but they use the data against the Tea Party and the, and the FBI used against the Occupy group, and other political parties were attacked by similarly. Um, and of course, they, of course, people looking to unmask uh, information about individuals, that's done through these kinds of organizations, you know, or they can request that through directly to NSA. See, the problem is, is a human failing here is that the people given the power over others, eventually they use it. You know, that's historically true. It's a weakness in humanity. There's no checks and balances at all involved in this at all. The Congress says and the courts say they have oversight. That's a joke, okay. They don't have any oversight. Even, in, even after the Snowden material came out, the head judge, uh, Reggie Walton, on the FISA court, the Foreign Intelligence Relations uh, Court, said, he came out and said, try to make an excuse for his court, and the judge is on it, that uh, they really didn't have a lot of uh, capability of verifying anything that NSA, CIA, or FBI were telling them. In fact, he doesn't have very little. He has none. He's totally dependent on them telling the truth. And they only tell him what they want to tell him. And the same is true with the intelligence a committees in Congress. And the same is true in every country of the world. No country in the world, no government of any country in the world has any control of their intelligence agencies. They do not know what they're doing. And they have no control, of, really, of any of them. They can't stop it. They, they would say they go to oversight, but when they go in, all they're told is, uh, is uh, what the agency wants them to hear. So they get the story du jour, the story of the day, from, from that agency. That's the problem I see. But so in order to do this, you see, they don't tell any of the attorneys, the judges, or anything. You never sign anything, never put it in affidavits. There's no documentation that they used NSA data or 
NSA, collect the data from all their collaborators to do any of this. And so what that means is they have to do a parallel construction. They, they reconstruct data or go out and get data that would, they could substitute in a court of law for, for the NSA data because then they could use that as a justification for the warrant, which they didn't get in the first place. <laughs> so, but, uh, so that basically means they're perjuring themselves in a court of law. Now, this is not just for us in the United States. Anybody who has, a rev who has any relationship with the FBI or the DEA worldwide, they're all getting insight through these programs. And so whatever actions they take are based on the um, unconstitutional collection of data by the NSA and the CIA. But they're still using it. They, we, in fact, one of the, one of the uh, federal agents using this data said, commented to a Reuters reporter, this is a Reuters slide. He said, you know, this is such a great program, I just hope we can keep it secret. Well, what does that mean? It means we have a secret government. Right? When, you marry, when you marry the intelligence agencies with the police, you have a secret police. Now in Germany, they called that the Gestapo or the Stasi. So I refer to NSA as the new Stasi agency. <laughs> and unfortunately, that's, you know, we haven't been able to do anything. I, I am uh, attempting to do everything I possibly can against these people, supporting four separate lawsuits against uh, the President uh, Trump, uh, pre previously against President Obama, and the in intelligence agencies of the United States for unconstitutional collection of data. Uh, we have to do it for our laws. Our Constitution governs uh, violation of privacy rights of U.S. citizens, so we're attacking them that way in a court of law. And I just got my first chance with the Third Circuit Court of Appeals uh, to sub sub submit some of this N NSA data about their own programs into the court of law. Now, it's going to be tough for NSA to deny it because now it's in the federal courts. These, this is the court that's one, one level down from the Supreme Court in the United States. And it's at four separate uh, uh, circuit courts. Uh, one in the second, one in the third, one in the ninth, one in the eleventh. So, so I'm coming at them as many, from as many directions as I possibly can and hopefully one of them will get through to the Supreme Court, and when it does, uh, we'll get to them. And if we fix it... I mean, and, and if we fix it, why, hopefully that'll spread around the world to the rest of the countries who've adopted this from... because we started it, okay? You know, we started it, we Americans were the first one in the bulk collection pit, the rest of you came along a little later. That's only because we were close in and it was convenient. No, so we got it first. At <laughs> any rate, <clears throat> the point is they're all doing the wrong thing for two basic reasons. Number one, it, it buries their analysts with, uh, with uh, too much data, so it makes them totally dysfunctional. They can't figure out anything and they're just losing it. A and I, by the way, I, I provided uh, from Edward Snowden's material copies of memos written by internal analysts in NSA and MI5 and various other places saying that they are buried in data, they just can't figure out anything, they've got too much data. Well, <clears throat> I gave that to all the, uh, to the House of Lords as documentation of what I was saying was true, and they simply ignored it. Um, so, uh, but, but the, ma the main problem I had from the very beginning was it was a total invasion of the privacy rights of everybody on the planet, starting with us in the U.S. I mean, they were using the programs we, we, you know, were, that were developed in, in the SIGINT Automation Research Center, which I was uh, founder of. And uh, the, the people I had building those things were the ones they had to depend on to implement them uh, worldwide uh, on a scale that uh, is still growing. There was no limitation to the scale. Uh, I mean, we did flat, B plus 3 type flat file uh, indexing schemes, with, which meant if you, if you needed more, or more space, you simply added another server, spread out the graph, you know. And so it didn't, there was no, we saw no limit to anything we could do. I mean, we'd already taken in trillions of transactions and that wasn't a problem at all. Once I found out that they started taking in everything that the, intelli the telecommunications companies were having in terms of U.S. communications, principally in the, starting with the public switch telephone network, and then starting very later, very shortly after that, the internet and, the, and the, uh, basically the World Wide Web, uh, it took me, I found that out in the second week of October 2001, and it took me the week and a half to get out of the place, so I got out uh, Holloway, Hall Halloween day, 31st of October 2001. And uh, since then, I've been 
I've been uh, trying to uh, advocate internally in the, NS in the intelligence uh, committees and the in inspector generals of the both Department of Justice and Department of Defense um, uh, to have them, I mean, this is, obviously this is totally unconstitutional. It's a violation of the Penn Register Law, Electronic Privacy Act, Electronic Security Act, any of the laws in place to, to cover FCC regulations governing any of the telecoms. Uh, that's why the telecommunications companies had to get retroactive immunity in 2008 because they had so many laws that they were violating every day. Uh, and you know, they, they're still doing that. So, so the point was that uh, they, they were all in it together and each one of the committees and the, and, the, and the courts had to protect one another. It was a cover up because they were all involved in this. And the White House uh, was the starter. It was actually started by Darth Cheney. I call him Darth Cheney because he went to the dark side what he said anyway. <clears throat> so at any rate, uh, uh, in the meantime, uh, we had been advocating for a targeted approach where you went after groups of people that were doing bad things and you could easily define it by social networks in the, in the world, either in the public switch telephone net or even in the internet. We had no difficulty doing that at line speeds, uh, fiber optic rates. We were able to sessionize fiber optic rates at, uh, at STEM level transmissions in 1998. So from there on, we were able to do deep packet inspection on all that stuff and reconstruct everything on the lines. And so we, uh, we, were, we were able to see uh, networks and we built all these social networks uh, using the transmitting, the routing data, the IPs and, uh, and the uh, addressing schemes of uh, the internet as well as the phone network. And we had no difficulty doing a targeted approach then of using that data to filter out what was relevant to targets we were interested in, or should be interested in, uh, out, of the, out of the flow of information around the world at whatever rate uh, they were doing it. We simply subdivided and conquered it by, by the divide and conquer approach. That was our way of doing it, and our targeting approach, we even took the Customs and Border Protection after we left NSA. Um, and one of the ways we did that, I mean, this is the only unclassified version I can take of big data, okay? It's the only thing I have. Uh, so we went down there and we had a, uh, Bureau of Industrial Security up there of uh, the C Commerce Department uh, published this uh, alert uh, because some m military in, in Iraq overran a bomb making factory and they found some some parts in there and they looked the parts they saw the part numbers and I think they traced the part numbers back to companies in the US selling them to uh, Iranian companies in Dubai now, the reason they located in Dubai, because it's outside of Iran, it's outside of the exclusion for trade, and so they, they operating out of Dubai, they could order these parts, you know? So the Bureau of Industrial Security had to alert everybody in the world that this was going on. So we took that and used uh, Google <laughs> and went on the web. Uh, this was some more of the data they had. So, but, but, but we used it and went onto the web and uh, Googled all the things and started looking at, uh, uh, at the data. This was also given, continued now. At any rate, uh, what we did was we went out, we added all kinds of information to that, looking at, uh, we added fax numbers, phone numbers, addresses, more data on uh, people involved, and more company names involved. Uh, and then at the end of it, uh, just before, uh, after the BIS report came out, uh, they, they uh, once that was out, they took all the names of the companies they had off the web. And then, uh, and then uh, put, <coughs> put other, put, kept that data out of the way because then they thought uh, that uh, BIS, the BIS and uh, uh, Customs and Border Protection were still, were still looking for the old data. They didn't, didn't have that confirmed, so they removed it and they changed the names. But in the process of changing it, they, they used one of the new numbers, phone numbers, with some of the old data. So that gave us the end and we, we uh, then traced all to the new data they went. And as they went, we followed them and we didn't lose a thing. Of course, the custom of border protection and the Pentagon and various other people in the intelligence, they did lose it, but we used Google and followed them. So we provided all that data to them, and since we didn't trust the U.S. government to do the right thing, we also gave it to our counterparts in Canada because they were using, losing people from IED attacks too, so we didn't trust our government to do the right thing, so we passed it up there too. They, of course, did the right thing. Uh, we didn't, of course. Uh, but. Uh, the whole idea was you, we, we compiled all this list of information that we got from them, um, and from those approaches, and gave it to, uh, gave it to Colonel Woody at the Pentagon. His, he, he was the group uh, that was looking at the IED 
you know, prevention of IED attacks and so on. So we passed all this data down to try to cut the supply of uh, parts going into them. The reason they use different multiple company names to, to, to do the uh, construction of the IEDs is because each company would order a different part. Um, and uh, the idea was that if the Customs and Border Protection looked at a given company, which is the way they do it, uh, they would only see one part of an IED and never deduce that they were putting together an IED. So unless you collapse them down by a common attribute, like they're all sharing the same phone number, or they're all sharing the, in the same address or something like that, to put these multiple companies into one place where you see the whole activity, then you sum it all together by their names and you see the IEDs. So you can see what they're doing when you do that. And so we proposed to Customs and Border Protection that we do this for them uh, they had a small data set of about a half a billion records uh, over 10 years of imports and, and exports. That was like one import could be a thousand cars on a ship, you know. So it was like half a billion records. That, uh, and they, they said it was a real mess because uh, the data was dirty and all that. We looked at it and thought it was a gold mine. There's all kinds of information here, phone numbers on addresses, so we could lay out the entire, <clears throat> all the entire world's uh, phone numbering schemes and how they change as they change since they put these things out there. So we proposed to them that we scrape the entire world's websites and uh, pull together a consolidated list of however many million uh, companies there were in the world, uh, one to 200 million, something like that, and uh, be able to do a collapse on this and study all those and find those who were doing or showing attributes of doing something illegal which is what this multi-addressing scheme implies. So that would define a, a set of, of, of suspicion, of zones of suspicion for companies in, uh, involved in the world trade. And we estimated that from our study of that we scraped the entire website, uh, the PARS guide was the website in, uh, Iran, in Dubai, uh, listing all the uh, Iranian companies in Dubai. There were 5,032 of them. And uh, when we did that, we uh, found uh, 222 different company names that subgrouped into 55 different groups that were doing different nefarious things for the Iranian government, like uh, smuggling dope, uh, weapons, that kind of thing. Like getting, uh, buying uh, equipment for IEDs and, and looking around for things like that would help them with triggers and nuclear stuff. And so uh, we needed, to, we passed all that along too. And of course our government is just too dense to to really do anything. So once we did that, we said we'd estimated that the entire world would produce perhaps 40,000 targets for you to do targeted selection of searching of incoming uh, crates and imports and, and uh, don't do exports to these companies. So we thought we could do that in the first run of our data and it would take us six months to correct all the data and make that happen uh, with uh, Kirk Weeby and myself and two programmers. Uh, but that was too cheap, you see. That was, they wanted to let a $1.2 billion contract to IBM to do it, so they fired us and brought in IBM. So, <laughs> and they still haven't done this, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> so, the ultimately thing, thing that came out was they, they indicted everybody that was involved in all this. Uh, they arrested a few of them in Florida, but uh, some of them were back in Iran, so they couldn't get to them but they left the indictment out there. But it took them two years to do the indictment from the, fact, from the time that we found all the data. That's a really fast judicial process, right? So, but uh, this was something they could do worldwide on everything, every possible uh, uh, criminal activity in the world by looking at that social networks, looking at targeting approach, which w would give everybody privacy. If you use that as a filter right up front, nobody's data gets taken in unless they are a part of a criminal activity or falling into a zone of suspicion around that activity. So it would give everybody in the world privacy. And, but that's not what they wanted. They didn't want privacy. They first removed our filter up front so they could take in everything. Then they took away all the encryption we used to give privacy to people once we took the data in until we had a warrant. And uh, they removed that. And then they removed the auditing routine in the back that looked at everybody that came in and what they did when they came there, where they went, what data they looked at, what they did with the data. And they removed that because they didn't want anybody to know what they were going to do. They didn't even want internally anybody to know. So it's not just that they're keeping secrets from us, they're keeping secrets from Congress and everybody else, even people inside their agency. Because the vast majority don't know, I think there's only about 3,000 people now inside NSA that really are involved in one way or another or no direct evidence about this, this program. So <clears throat> that's the, that's the uh, sick part of it. 
you know, this is like a secret democracy that's not, not a real democracy. I mean, Goethe said it pretty well. Um, he, you know, he said, um, no one is more hopelessly enslaved than those who falsely believe they're free. And that's us. So at any rate, I have this little uh, thing here. I'll try to get it out of the way. I hope you can see it. I can't see it. What's this thing doing here? Well, we have more details about our startup soon. Um, we, Kirk and I are in, in, in Europe because we can't get anything done in the U.S., so we're going to get done. Uh, we're going to advise anybody, any organization or government uh, on ways you can do uh, privacy and security by design. Um, and uh, we're going to help... Uh, get one of those capabilities up and running here in the, in the Europe somewhere, because obviously the US and the UK are too dense to realize it can be done. Actually, it's their, their agenda is the one that's driving them, and that's one that means money, power, and control. And the way you get that is to take in data on everybody in the planet, and that gives you that power. Then you can swindle money because you can let things happen because of the way you're doing business, things happen, and that's more justification to get more money. To It's like a swindle. I called ter the terrorism thing of trading privacy for uh, security a, a lie from the beginning. And that's just the way they swindled everybody. Because when the way they took in all the data, that meant they couldn't stop anything. That meant more people get killed. They say they need more money, more people, more bureaucracy to stop it. They get that and more people get killed by another attack because they get too much data. And they keep dumping more and more on people. It's just... Uh, they're perpetuating the same problem. They're not facing the issues. They don't realize what the problem really is. And, uh, and people are dying as a result. So we're over here to try to do something about that. And hopefully we will get there. See, I have another slide here, right? No? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. uh, one question comes to mind. Being the technical director that you were, how did you end up noticing this rather than approving that or knowing of all that from the very beginning? Uh, well, see, uh, as the technical director, I was looking at the, what, is the, what is the biggest problem that analysts in the, in the uh, NSA had it to, to solving problems and... Uh, uh, predicting the intentions and capabilities of uh, people who are going to hurt people or criminal activity. Uh, and it turned out to be the digital explosion of communications, cell phones, the internet, and so on. And so I had to design a way of uh, getting into it. But, but I, it, was it was pretty clear that uh, in order to do that, we, we would uh, be violating everybody's privacy unless we did something to, to, to eliminate that. So that's why I built in a social targeting uh, and pulling out only that information, letting everything else go by. Uh, and that design was one of the things they didn't want. They wanted to take in everything, so they wanted to get rid of that filter. But you see, in order for NSA to put that into place and get it running, they had to use the same contractors that I did to have my program built, because they were the only ones who knew how to put it together and get it up and running. Uh, no one else in NSA did. And they had no other programs that could handle the massive amounts of data. So they had to use my programs. And when they did that, some of them came to me and said, you know what they're doing? And he said, they're taking in all this data on U.S. citizens down the hall from us and, uh, and uh, building these graphs and everything and just doing, uh, analyzing uh, all, and violating the privacy of everybody in the United States. Then, of course, after that, spread to everybody in the world. But, but that, that's how I found out about it. And once I did that, that was the first time to me I had to get out of here. I knew no one would do that in the NSA without approval from above. And that came directly out of Darth Cheney's office. Yeah. Question. Uh, the filtering uh, and the targeting of so uh, social networks uh, needs a lot of data. And then you can extract patterns. And then you can throw away the data because you don't need it anymore. Is that right? Uh, well, you can you see uh, if you uh, there's a couple of ways to do it. You know, one if you have a seed that is you know a bad guy, you could look at his social network and build from that, and then you could say one degree beyond that is how, as far as I'll go to pull data in. It really ends up two degrees from the bad guy, but 
you only pull data in from one degree from him. Uh, and so that means uh, that you're focused, all the rest of the world's data goes right by, and that's what you pull. And the metadata is the way you pull it out because that gives you the ability to... I mean, you're looking at the data that's required for the network to route data. And if you do that, then, then it's easy to pull all that data out, and that's all you really get. And it gives people privacy, and you get a rich environment for your analysts to succeed. That's what they don't understand. I'm still curious. How can you uh, uh, get patterns from things you have never seen before? Uh, because uh, Unexpe we, the unexpected. Uh, yeah, we uh, stuff. we used uh, actually two approaches out of three, but it was deductive, inductive, and ad abductive approach. The deductive approach simply said uh, it's get good dealing with the graph. If you're in the graph and you're close to within proximity of two hops of a known terrace, then you're going to be in a zone of suspicion. You'll be looked at. It doesn't mean you're guilty. It just means you're going to be looked at. And then a decision will be made, yes or no. If yes, then what's the reason? You know, and if you get in included, then the entire graph will shift if you become a target at that point, you see. So it's a, and that was done by software. The other was the inductive approach. Uh, that was the main one. That is, if you are um, looking at sites advocating pedophilia, or sites advocating jihad or terrorist uh, activities or violence against the West, uh, and you keep repeatedly looking at them or look at multiple sites advocating that, then that gives you the idea that you are a potential uh, zone of, in the fall into zone of suspicion. And that means you get looked at. So at, so at that point, you get the data coming in. But you can do it all having all their attributes encrypted until you can prove that they are, in fact, a part of the uh, illegal activity. Last question, is, isn't it handy that they do have a lot of data about the White House, the people who are now in the White House? Yeah, they do. Yeah, they have everything they do, <laughs> including, including the codes to decrypt their communications. Hello. Um, yeah. You mentioned the, uh, the immense capacity to store all this data from everyone. And um, I was wondering um, in what companies and did they cooperate willingly to create such a capacity uh, to store all the data, and in particular IBM. And uh, yeah, so can we still trust our servers? And uh, that's kind no, of <laughs> it's a, every one of them, and no, <clears throat> because in the United States, if you're a company in the United States, they can force you by law to give them their data. It's only now coming out. I mean the. The business, they call it the business records requisition. Uh, the first, uh, first thing from Edward Snowden was the uh, general warrant issued by the FISA court to the Verizon company to turn over all the information about their customers, over 110 million U.S. citizens, you know? And uh, that was a, a violation of the Constitution, a direct violation. That's why the Judge Reggie Walton came out and tried to defend the court because of that. Uh, but. They have the power to do that with uh, all of the companies, and I would point out that uh, that was uh, BR 13-80, uh, which meant it's the 80th order of 2013 to companies to give business records, which is the second quarter, and it's issued every 90 days, so every quarter an order comes out to each individual company. So, uh, and uh, the way I reckoned uh, in the public switch telephone network, the first two companies in line in the network uh, providing data were AT&T and Verizon. So Verizon would get, AT&T would get order one in quarter one, Verizon gets order two in quarter one, and then it gets order 80 in quarter two. That means there's 78 companies participating. So that's 78 companies participating, banks, you know, telecom, communications company, ISPs on the internet, and so on. So uh, did they get anything in exchange for all the information they passed on to the NSA? Yeah, money. They get, paid for it. they get paid for it, yeah. There's a whole schedule on, <clears throat> a whole schedule on the rate of how much they get paid. <clears throat> that's true. That's, that's impressive. <laughs> Thank you for being here and uh, everything you've done for basically all of us. Uh, and yeah. my question is, when you see these um, <clears throat> testimonies from, for example, uh, James Clapper, Keith Alexander, when they're being asked directly, are you monitoring, you can kind of see in their eyes and when you read other press that monitoring means a completely different thing for people within the NSA. So my question is, how do we make questions more um, relevant to level the playing fields to make sure that we're all talking about the same thing? Well, it's hard, especially when they lie to you. I mean, you know, yes. what can you, not wittingly, but you know. <laughs> but how, how, how do we, 
how how do we make the questions sharper when we say okay we know uh, when we say here, monitoring okay. then <clears throat> yeah here's here's how uh, Senator Wyden uh, phrased the question properly I think is what you're getting he he, he asked uh, General Alexander how many how many U.S. citizens does he have in his databases that's the right question it's not you know if you talk about collection well to Alexander you know he uses a word game collection means somebody looking at it at NSA <clears throat> so it's not collected till somebody looks at it well that's a that's horseshit you know. If I collect all your data, I've got it in my database. So he asked the right question. How many do you have in the, your databases? Well, it came back, uh, he said he couldn't answer him, so he came back in writing. This is on the web, if you want to go look at it, it's really a joke. He says, we, he, we cannot tell you that because it would be a violation of the privacy rights of US citizens. <laughs> uh, this is... Hi, as an American, I'd like to uh, say thank you for your service. And I also wanted to ask, as a citizen, if there's anything we can do to make it easier for agents to blow the whistle or to encourage them to become whistleblowers. Well, uh, I, I always advocate the, the squeaky wheel gets the oil. So uh, uh, complain, bitch, moan, break, groan. If, you're, if your congressman or senator comes out for a town meeting, confront them with it. Why are you backing this? This is obviously unconstitutional. You're violating your oath of office to protect and defend the Constitution, and what are you going to do about it, or should I work for somebody else? And if you aren't going to stop this, I'm going to work against you, give my money to somebody else, and vote to fire you. You know, and the otherwise, sue the bastard. That's what I'm doing. <clears throat> uh, do you see a cultural change within the NSA that there may be more people who stand up and, uh, well, choose a different path to choose to reform the NSA from inside, or is that... Uh... Yeah, I think, uh, I, I think that's uh, probably happening, especially with the younger generation going into NSA. The older generation, I mean, we did a Myers-Briggs study of personal traits of people at, working at NSA in 1992 or something like that. And it turned out that 85% of them were ISTJs. So they're all introverts. You know, it's like these are the people who like to work in their desks, you know. I mean, mathematicians are that way. They're very quiet people. So look, give me a pencil, I'll figure it out. You know, and go in a corner, here's the answer, you know. That's all they do. But uh, they're very easy to threaten. Those are the kind of people you can easily threaten. Uh, and so that's what really what's been going on inside NSA. I mean, they have a program now called See Something, Say Something about your fellow workers. Well, I mean, that's what the Stasi did, you know? That's why I call them the Stasi, new Stasi, you know? They're, they're picking up all the techniques from the Stasi and the KGB and the, and the Gestapo and the SS. They're, they just aren't getting violent yet that we know of, okay? Internally in the U.S., outside is another story. Now we know something about the U.S. programs, but do we know something about the other nation, like Russia? We know that China has some internal spying program, but do they have capabilities of like, external spying? Uh, yes. These are the countries participating with NSA. Uh, of course, the, the rest of the, uh, the five eyes up there, and then the, uh, everybody else is classified as third parties except for fourth parties, which we don't talk about because we don't want anybody to know we have relations with them. So, you know, they're off the board. But uh, these are the countries, and each country has a different relationship with NSA. I mean, I think eight or nine of these countries in the third party category are cooperating in the bulk acquisition of data on the internet with NSA and GCHQ and the rest of the Five Eyes. The big one missing there is Russia. So we should suppose that Russia has some similar secret programs or... Well, Russia does the same thing in reverse. You know, they're looking at us the same way. Yeah. Everybody's doing this uh, to, the, to the ability <clears throat> and the capabilities that they have. Thank this you. is standard spying. I mean, that's why diplomacy was created, so we could spy on people, you know. Um, would you say that the way that they are doing the wrong thing is incapability or not willing to do the right thing? Yeah, it's, uh, they are capable. I mean, uh, you could see some of these whistleblowers still coming out. That, so they, they are, there are people who understand they're doing the wrong thing, and they could create a way to do it like I did internally. Uh, the trouble is, you, we have people managing these agencies who are fundamentally uh, corrupt because there's so much money involved in this, uh, you know, money corrupts and it's just... I mean, the budget for NSA is like 16 billion a year. And if you, 
For the entire intelligence community, it's been close to a trillion dollars since 9-11. So that's a lot of money. And, and there's a whole empire, intelligence empire, that's built up over the, over the years in the United States and also in the UK, and it's spreading. I mean, <clears throat> some of the testimony from uh, B&D and what they're doing with NSA, uh, the Bundestag has found out recently about many of the things they're doing. So they're all doing the wrong thing in terms of looking to stop things, really. They're not taking a targeted approach. That's a professional, disciplined look at your, at your job and the target you're supposed to be looking at and watching instead of looking at everybody, spreading your effort across the entire planet. How is it possible that we still have organized crime on a global scale, some of this outside of the power of the United States, of the direct influence? At least, I would imagine, organized crime from foreign countries should be the subject of this kind of information. Yep. Is it used and we don't know? Or is it not used and why? Thank you. I, I would say they attempt to use it, but the, if you look at the... If you Google um, X key score, which is the query routine going into the databases for most of the people, or IC reach, I don't know that most of that's out there yet, but if you looked at that and you could see the, the way they ask the queries, it's about putting in words and phrases and just like you do on a Google search. So in a Google search, you get tons of material back, so that approach gives you tons of material, which means you've got to go through all the items to try to find it, and where is it in this list of... So you get 100,000 items back, where is it? Is it 90,000, 80? Can you get there? No, and the answer is no. That's why they were failing. So you're saying they're failing because they're not able to interpret the data. That's exactly right. They can't figure out what they've got. So how come you are able to be here? Um, yeah, yeah why, are, why aren't you dead or at least in jail for something <laughs> wrong you said or if they've got so much power over it? Well, yeah. <laughs> Well, as I said in the, in the movie about me, a good American, I said, you know, uh, uh, if they ever do it, if they ever do anything like that, uh, everyone will know who did it and why. So uh, they don't want to expose themselves to that kind of uh, uh, polit political and, uh, you know, uh, reaction by the pu public in the United States because that, and now I'm, I'm basically well known around the world, so... They, I don't think they... Uh, I want to get them in court any way I can. If they want to do that, that's, uh, that's one of the ways. At least if they don't terminate me, I'll be able to do that. <laughs> so basically, by making it obvious, uh, they're your enemy, yeah. you're safe. Public exposure to a degree is security, you know. Okay, yeah. thanks. Please give a warm round of applause. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.